Good afternoon. I'm Jennifer Wilkes, director of the John L. Warfield Center for African and African American Studies at the University of Texas at Austin. I'd like us to begin by acknowledging that those of us joining from the US, Canada, and Mexico are meeting on the indigenous lands of Turtle Island, the ancestral name for what is now called North America. Moreover, I would like to acknowledge the Alabama Cushada, Cado, Carrizo Come Crudo, Kualuitecan, Comanche, Kickapoo, Lipan Apache, Tonkawa, and Isleta del Sur Pueblo, and all the American Indian and indigenous peoples and communities who have been or have become a part of these lands and territories in Texas. Next, please join me in thanking Center Events Coordinator Justice Madden and Graduate Assistants Kelsey Mason and Beth Colon Pizzini, without whose efforts this program would not be happening. Thank you all. And thank you to our audience for coming to our final faculty book talk of the 2020 2021 academic year. This series celebrates the publication of new work by Warfield Center affiliates. And it has been an important means of maintaining community and remembering that there are occasions to celebrate, even amidst a backdrop of disruption, loss, and countless other difficulties. Our featured author today is Dr. Frank A. Garitti, who is an associate professor of history and African American studies at Columbia University. The Warfield Center is honored to feature his work today, not only because his just released book, the Sports Revolution, How Texas Changed the Culture of American Athletics is about, quote, Texas-based sports entrepreneurs and athletes from marginalized backgrounds, end quote, and has been published by UT Press. Today's event is also a homecoming, albeit virtually. Prior to joining the Columbia faculty, Dr. Garitti taught at UT and was an active member of the Warfield community, including serving as director from 2009 to 2013, hence his inclusion in our faculty book talk series. Dr. Garitti is an award-winning author and teacher who specializes in sport history, urban history, and the history of the African diaspora in the Americas. His next book project, Assembly in the Fragmented City, a History of the Los Angeles Memorial Coliseum examines the iconic structure's impact on the emergence of Los Angeles as a global city. Our featured discussant is Dr. Darren Kelly, who is the Associate Vice President of Academic Diversity Initiatives and Student Engagement for the Division for Diversity and Community Engagement here at UT Austin. His research focuses on race and sport, leadership and community building. I had the pleasure of serving with Dr. Kelly on the committee to rethink UT spring 2021 commencement. And I'm grateful that he made room in his busy schedule to share his time and expertise with the Warfield Center community. Please join me in welcoming Drs. Garitti and Kelly. Uh, Dr. Wilkes, thank you so much for the wonderful introduction. And, and it's a, really a pleasure to be here again. I, I, uh, you know, we're going to make this as, as, as a uh, feel like we're all in, in, in the same room together because we are. And this is how we do in 2021. Um, and uh, I'm excited just really to, to talk to our, our, our featured scholar and author and um, former UT professor, Dr. Frank Garitti, um, who's here joining with us to talk about his new book, The Sports Revolution, How Texas Changed the Culture of American Athletics, just released today. Welcome, Dr. Garitti. Uh, Darren Kelly, thank you so much uh, for introducing me and, and, and Dr. Wilkes as well. Uh, this certainly is a homecoming. Um, it is a virtual one, so I wish... We were there, and my memories of the Warfield Center are when it it was in Jester Hall. So I, you know, that the, the, the Jester Hall space, which was was intimate and lovely, is the space that I I always associate with the center. Although I know that the the center has a great space now, even though you folks are not able to congregate there right now. But hopefully next year you will. Absolutely, and, and folks, so, so we're just going to have a conversation with Dr. Garitti, talk about his background, talk about the book and the issues that he presents in there. Um, we're going to have a discussion, and then we're going to open it up for Q and A. You know, so if you have questions or things come to mind as you are going through 
um, our discussion, things come up, or, or there are some issues that are pressing currently that relate to the topic and subject matter that we discussed today. Um, feel free to put those in the Q&A and we hope to answer some of those questions when we get to that portion of the, of, of the session. So um, with that being said, Dr. Garidi, if we can just go ahead and jump right into it. Um, you know, I, I had a great chance to read the book and, and, you know, certainly there's some great positionality and something that's unique to, the, to this is that, of course, you're, you're, you're not a native Texan. Right. You you mentioned that you first watched a thrilling Monday night football game featuring the Monday night, uh, the, the Miami Dolphins and Houston Oilers in a cramped apartment. I believe it's in the Bronx Co-op City. Is that right? Well, then we were living in Queens, but eventually okay. we lived in the Bronx. But at that time, we lived in Flushing, Queens in a cramped apartment, certainly. <laughs> <laughs> so, so how does the, how does a native New Yorker become interested in exploring the history of Texas sports and begin to embark on a project like this? Yeah. Uh, well, you know, it kind of started by watching uh, Texas sports teams on television, you know, as a kid growing up, right? Uh, you know, one of the things I talk about in this book is the enormous impact of television in popularizing sport. And it just so happened that in the late 70s, 80s, when I was coming up, this is the heyday of the Dallas Cowboys. This is, the, uh, you know, where they were becoming America's team. This is the heyday of the Houston Oilers, you know, now the Tennessee Titans. Um, so, you know, those images of those games, those memorable games, college football games with Texas, the Texas Longhorns and SMU and the University of Houston, I talk about all these programs in this book, you know, uh, alerted me to the existence of Texas, believe it or not, as a New Yorker. But, you know, even more impactful than that was when I wound up teaching and living in Austin from 2004 to 2015. Mm -hmm. And at the time, and Longhorn fans will know this, this is when Longhorn football was in its heyday with Vince Young as its quarterback. This is when the San Antonio Spurs, the NBA franchise are winning championships with Tim Duncan and Greg Popovich as their coach, who's still the coach right. now. This is Dallas Mavericks are winning championships at this time in 2011 when they beat LeBron James's uh, Miami Heat. So, you know, the sports culture of Texas was robust. Uh, it was very much a part of my life as a spectator. Uh, and, and so, you know, it made an impression on me, right? Because, you know, for better or for worse, Texas is serious business and uh, sport is serious business in Texas. Right. But, you know, even more than that, you know, when I was a director of the Warfield Center for African-American Studies, African and African-American Studies, uh, you know, I finished my first book. And it was really important to me as a director for our unit to really to, to continue to build relationships with the Black Texas community. Many of us Black faculty are from elsewhere like me. Uh, and it was very important to us, certainly in the legacy of the center, to, to keep community outreach as part of its mission, you know, not just with the Austin community, but also with other Texas communities. And we started a whole bunch of initiatives with the Warfield Center still keeps up with to this day. And doing that work, I became interested and I discovered the profound, fascinating history of Black Texas uh, tech, uh, football uh, uh, sports uh, among African-Americans in Texas during the Jim Crow era in particular. Uh, Michael Hurd, who's actually a member of the audience here, you know, he had a profound influence on me in looking at, you know, the ways in which sports allow Black communities to survive Jim Crow, right? right? So, you know, we scholars look at music, we look at art, we look at all other cultural forms, we think about Black experiences, but sport was really one that tends to get overlooked in terms of looking at Black community survival, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and so that really got me thinking about looking at this as a project, thinking about how the marginalized peoples in Texas, Black and Mexican origin peoples, approach sport? How did it help, how did it help them survive uh, in, in the Jim Crow era? And then eventually when Texas becomes a big time uh, sports uh, capital, uh, how they become central players into the story of the rise of the sports industry in Texas in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s during the heyday of the civil rights uh, movement, the feminist movement, and even the Mexican American movement. So really mm -hmm. it was those personal experiences, those professional experiences, uh, that allowed me to think that this was a, 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 a book project worthy, a, a, a really research project worthy of investigation, of publication in a book. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, you brought up Michael Hurd. Uh, if, if you all haven't read Thursday Night Lights, uh, I highly Excellent suggest book. another UT Press book. That's um, correct. Go pick that up. Um, I used that in my class uh, this past uh, year uh, for my race and sport class, but it's certainly a great chronicle of, uh, of the PVL, the Prairie View Interscholastic League, which was the right. equivalent of UIL for African Americans here in the state of Texas um, before integration. Um, but so I really want to get to the meat uh, on, on the bone here. So, you know, you really talk about this sports revolution that the U.S. was going through in the 1960s and 70s. What was this sports revolution? Sports today in this country is a billions dollar industry, right? Uh, it wasn't always that way. 
So, uh, you know, the, there are these moments in U.S. history. The 1920s is one when college football and Major League Baseball become really popular in the United States, when sports becomes a sort of national cultural phenomenon. There's another moment like that, even more profound, and that moment is the 1960s and 70s, when you see the emergence of new professional leagues the American Football League, the, the American Basketball Association. You're seeing new franchises pop up throughout the country. You're seeing stadiums built all over the place, right? Uh, at least 50 during the 1960s and 70s, right? Uh, you see sports becoming a, a television phenomenon, right? Prime time, uh, sp people watch sports in, in prime on primetime television. That's, a, that's an outgrowth of the revolutions of this era, right? It's just the same time that the civil rights and the feminist movements are happening. So this book is trying to bring these two, two things together. It's trying to suggest that in order to understand how sports becomes big time, big industry, right? How it becomes a massive cultural uh, phenomenon in our country. We have to link these two things together and we have to see how uh, the process of desegregation of athletics, right? Pushed by the civil rights movement contributed to that phenomenon, right? right. So. Uh, so it's a book that really tells the story of the growth of the sports industry and really focuses on Texas because Texas has an outsized impact on all the processes that I just laid out. You can't understand modern professional football without understanding the impact of Texas-based uh, uh, entrepreneurs like Lamar Hunt, uh, K.S. Bud Adams, and Clint Murkison, who, who own uh, the, the, the Houston Oilers, the Dallas Texans, eventually the Kansas City Chiefs, and the Dallas Cowboys. They sort of foist themselves onto professional football. They create these franchises. They force a merger in 1966, which creates the modern monopoly that we know now as the NFL. Uh, you can't understand stadium construction. You know, the notion that stadiums are places where you where the affluent congregate and um, and enjoy luxury boxes. That is a direct outgrowth of the Houston Astrodome, which was built in Houston in 1965. Right. Uh, and you can't understand any of this phenomena without understanding the profound impact of, of Texas athletes, the black Texas athletes in particular. Right. So, you know, this is both a, an ex a book that looks at the impact of Texas in entrepreneurs and athletes. But then Texas itself is an interesting case study as a society that's steeped in conquest, colonization, steeped in slavery, steeped in Jim Crow segregation. Mm -hmm. And sport catalyzes a new moment in Texas history with the, with the, with the integration of athletics, uh, however partial it was. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's important to really distinguish, you know, how does Texas really stand out from this? And I think, you know, some critics may say, hey, look, Texas is just part of a broader landscape change in what's going on in the United States, right? All these schools were integrating um, in the South and the South Southeastern Conference, the Athletic Coast Conference and so forth, right? Um, there were already integrated schools in the Midwest and in the West Coast, right? So, I mean, how is really Texas position itself as being so unique within this sport culture to really distinguish itself from the other, from the, pretty much the rest of the country? Yeah, no, great question. Um, you know, certainly uh, in the Upper South, you know, there's a great book by Charles Martin, uh, Benching Jim Crow, which really is this wonderful analysis of the process of desegregation of coll collegiate athletics in the South, you know, throughout the entire, you know, for, for the, the mid 20th century uh, until 1980. So the upper South states, the Maryland's and places like that are desegregating first. But then when you're looking at the deep South, it's really Texas schools that are, you know, before what's now the SEC conference right. that are starting the process of desegregation of athletics. And sport is interesting because, you know, desegregation in, in higher educational institutions, or, you know, starts, of course, with Brown versus Board of Education. And then, well, before that, Sweat versus Painter in the Texas context and other landmark uh, court decisions. But athletics is really slow. Uh, you know, and we know this in the case of Texas, right? Uh, you know, um, you know, University of Texas is one of the last schools to integrate in the Southwest uh, Conference. And when they integrated in 1969-70 with Julius Whittier becomes the first black Texan, right. right? But in the bigger picture of the South, it is Texas schools that are starting this process first, right? Schools like the University, University of Houston, when they sign uh, Warren McVeigh to be their first black scholarship athlete to play on the football team. Right. At Southern Methodist University, when they signed Jerry Levias in 1964, right? These are schools that are not the big dogs of the old Southwest Conference. They're trying to compete with the Texases and the Arkansas. And that motive uh, is what prompts them to start the desegregation process, right? So, and this is happening before the Alabamas, before the schools in the Deep South, but the LSUs and schools like that. A lot of times we focus on the, on the Bear Bryant case of Alabama or even Darrell Royal in the case of Texas, but it's these aspiring schools that are trying to compete uh, uh, on, the, uh, on the national collegiate uh, landscape 
that really facilitate desegregation, right? So, you know, you could, you could frame the story as like, this is just an inevitable consequence of the civil rights movement. But I think it is significant to say like, what were the conditions in Texas that led these processes to start earlier than other parts of the South? And that's what makes it distinct. Um, I, I'm arguing this book. Absolutely. And so, you know, I, I think it's important and you really discuss this at length through um, multiple chapters in the book, but certainly race plays a, a major role in the sports revolution, right? So <laughs> you've talked about the desegregation of the historically white university athletic programs, specifically SMU and the University of Houston, right? Um, two non-traditional programs that weren't considered blue bloods of the Southwest Conference, or at least were aspiring to get into the conference as U of H was, right? And more specifically, looking at the football programs, um, but also the role that African-Americans played in helping to begin desegregating sporting venues, such as the Astrodome, right? Um, as much as do you buy into the thought that race and sport has a significant role in creating change in the greater society, how much do you buy into that? And, and how true is that in, in this book? Yeah. Yes, I do. Uh, I do, because, you know, we talk about these processes of happening of desegregation as if they just sort of happen in history. They happen in history because people make decisions. Right. They happened in history because black activists, uh, not just athletic activists, but things like the sit in movement, uh, you know, and, and movements on college campuses in the late 60s. You know, the, the Texas versions of the black power movement that are making a big stink, including at the U University of Texas, about why do we not have black football players? Daryl Royal. Right. <laughs> right? Right, right. They literally stormed Daryl Royal's office a few times in the late 1960s. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, there's no question that it is that activism by black activists on campus, right, and, and off, off of campus in the case of Houston, uh, right. that facilitates a significant social change. You know, I, I am arguing that desegregation mattered, right? It did provide opportunities for aspiring black athletes to, to potentially, uh, you know, move up in society, right? I mean, the whole tale of upper mobility through sports is somewhat mythological because most people don't, right? But right. for a certain uh, a number of black athletes, it was a significant development in their, in, 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 in their experiences and, and by extension, the entire society, right? So, yeah. you know, I am arguing that desegregation mattered. It made an impact, right? And because these sports were televised, right? This, this makes these developments have a national impact, right? And some of these, you know, broadcasters are Texans too. That's the other aspect of this story, which is interesting. Right. So, you know, in hindsight, it doesn't look like it matters that much as we see the kind of hi hierarchies that are still with us to this day. Mm -hmm. But at the time, you know, I, I want to focus on that moment because I think it allows us to think about the terms of inclusion. Mm -hmm. What were the terms of inclusion? Why is it that white schools in the South, in Texas, right, suddenly desegregate their programs in this period, right? right? Mm -hmm. Who yeah. benefited from those arrangements, right? Uh, yeah. Some athletes benefited from those arrangements, but by and large, athletic programs, certainly university athletic programs benefited, uh, mm -hmm. and certainly professional franchises benefited because, you know, they're, these, these sports franchises, these professional ones are benefiting and profiting from, from, the, from the labor of Black athletes and other athletes as well, right? So, so, so would you say that, I guess, that interest convergence played a major role for some of these organizations, these universities to say, hey, look, this is an opportunity that we have not only to just build our stature up in our programs, but certainly our money and more revenue streams. And we can, you know, really, really make a mark on this, right? So that maybe it wasn't necessarily that we're doing the right thing by, you know, integrating our teams, but hey, look, we have an opportunity to capitalize. So let's just go ahead and move forward. And, and Interest both. convergence is a great way to put it, Darren. Yes, absolutely, right? Um, at the same time, I think for some people, you know, there was an awakening. I think that, you know, any moment of social transformation is going to have both. There's going to be interest convergence, whether we're talking about abolitionism in the 19th century, or if sure. we're talking about the civil rights era in the 20th century, or if we're talking about now in our age of Black Lives Matter, <laughs> right? right. Um, right. So, you know, the interest convergence element is always there. You know, at the same time, you know, I think of the great quotes from Hayden Fry, who was the head coach of uh, Southern Methodist University. And he's from West Texas, from segregated West Texas. And he said that if he ever had an opportunity to become a coach, you know, he hated se segregation. He hated the illogic of segregation. It's somebody who had black friends but could not socialize with them in West Texas. And he said that if I ever became a coach, I would make a change and I would sign black athletes. And that was a condition of his hiring in 1961 when he didn't have to do that. And he did it, right? And mm -hmm. so yeah. I think there was a moral you know, a compass with a lot of these folks. But he also said, we signed Levias because we wanted to win, right? And so you have both of those elements there uh, in, in driving, you know, these changes in that period. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
Uh, I want to switch gears a little bit and, and, and transition. We're um, you know currently in Women's History Month right now. And I think mm -hmm. it's really important that we talk about, of course, the feminist and sexual revolutions happening in the 60s and 70s that also made their mark on the sports world. And you talk about this again in, in some chapters uh, in the book. Uh, and so a lot of people think that these movements were very complex. And in some people's eyes, they combated maybe even against each other in terms of how view women are supposed to be viewed and how they view themselves. And so again, we see that the expansion of women's professional tennis as a viable sports entity providing opportunities for up and coming athletes, but also we see the creation of the Dallas Cowboys cheerleaders. And again, I'm a Cowboys <laughs> fan, so I'm, I'm, I'm talking about myself here, but you know, the, you know, the Cowboys have not had any recent success history, but I digress, going back. No, so the creation not. of the Dallas Cowboys cheerleaders in the presence of, again, what some people would call scantily clad women on the sidelines for the gaze of male audiences. So how have these two movements had both positive and possibly negative influences on the sports culture and the sports revolution? Yeah, great questions. You know, when I decided to write this book, one of the first chapters I envisioned was one of the Dallas Cowboy cheerleaders. Uh, not because I'm a Cowboy fan, because I'm not, uh, but that's, that's beside the point. Uh, I don't begrudge you for being a Cowboy fan. There are many <laughs> of you out there. Um, but because I wanted to provide as comprehensive a picture of sports, of the sports industry as I could. Right. Yeah. So so I did that in two ways. One, well, it, it, it with respect to women's in sports. Number one, I look at the launching of the Women's Professional Tennis Tour, which happens in Houston in 1970, a story that many people know, but they don't locate it in the Texas context. Right. Um, in which you see this sort of feminist inspired activism, you know, propelling tennis players like Billie Jean King and Nancy Ritchie, who's from San Angelo, or Rosie Casales, who's from San Francisco, to push for equal pay or just for increased opportunities for women tennis players in the early 1970s, right? And that, you know, that development takes shape in Houston. And I culminate that chapter with the, the very famous uh, tennis match uh, uh, between Billie Jean King and Bobby Riggs that happened at the Houston Astrodome in 1973, right? Uh, the Cowboys cheerleader story is, 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 is another key part of the book. Because, you know, in the pre-Title IX era, the uh, Title IX being the Educational Amendments Act of 1972, which expands uh, uh, educational opportunities for women, including in sports, right? Um, you know, before that, cheerleading, you know, is a heavily feminized um, space for athletically inclined women who are perceived to be attractive, right? Uh, and I think of cheerleaders as athletes and performers because it's hard work. And it's really hard work when you're doing it in Texas, right? When you're training in the summers, whether you're uh, on a pep squad or a high school cheerleading squad or a college cheerleading squad, or if you're dancing for the Cowboys, it's intense labor. It's also undercompensated labor. This is something we see a lot in debates today about NFL cheerleaders. So I wanted to take the, 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 the industry of cheerleading seriously, right? And I wanted to look at the ways in which the Dallas Cowboy cheerleaders, when they form in 1972, the same year that Title IX is passed, by the way, contributed to the growth of the cowboy brand, yes. right? Uh, and those of us who are old enough to remember this period, this is sort of the heyday of the Dallas Cowboy cheerleaders, particularly the late 1970s, right? In which they are playing a huge role in making the Cowboys popular, right? And they, they provide a sort of parallel labor structure in which you have the male players playing on the field and you've got these women dancing for the Cowboys uh, making $15 a game in the late 19th, or $15 every home game, right? And they're not compensated for anything else. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so that's a fascinating story because it prompts all these debates around second wave feminism, right? Because cheerleading is rightly at the time derided as, as an industry that's just for, you know, serves female objectification. But I try to take the experience of cheerleaders seriously, right? Uh, and for a lot of these women, including black cheerleaders, this is a, a, a means of self-expression. This is a means of controlling their bodies. This is a way in which they are able to sort of achieve some level of fame and visibility, right? Uh, especially for black women and for white women from rural communities. They're rebelling against Bible Belt conventions. This, in some ways, this is their own sort of sexual awakening in a lot of ways, right? And so, mm -hmm. so that story is a story of exploitation, no doubt, which cheerleaders face to this day. But it's also a, a story in which you're seeing how women navigate this heavily gender segregated structure in which they're undercompensated, but they're also part of the scene. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, so in, in what other ways did sports catalyze social change? In what ways did it not? Yeah, I'll start with the way it didn't. I think if you just look around at sports today, you see how sport didn't catalyze <laughs> a lot of social change. It did, right? Um, mm -hmm. But in this case, because in the case of professional sports and collegiate sports, and this is what I argue in the book, 
you can't remove these from the economic transformations of the period in which sport is becoming big business at the collegiate level and at the professional level, right? So much of this sports revolution is fueled by oil money, right? Mm -hmm. It's fueled in the case of professional tennis, uh, Philip Morris tobacco money, right? right. Uh, it is this alliance of, you know, to use marketing terms, capital and labor, right? Uh, and labor is achieving opportunities in the sports industry in this period, right? What happens over time by the 1980s is that the sport management class grows and grows more powerful and they figure out ways to extract more value from athletic labor. And how do you see this? You see this in the skyrocketing salaries of head football coaches. In 1982, Jackie Sherrill is signed by Texas A&M to be their head football coach for then unprecedented $1.6 million, which is pennies today. Right. And that kind of blows the roof off of, uh, of salaries for head football coaches at, at colleges, right? And so you're seeing the growth of a white male dominated sport management class dominate sports, right? At all levels, right? Um, you're seeing the ways in which the sport revolution, you know, certainly benefits super talented, lucky athletes who are able to make careers for themselves. The Eric Dickerson's, the Earl Campbell's, the, you know, and other folks that I talk about in this book, you know, Clyde Drexler, right. Hakeem Olajuwon, the case of Houston, right? But the vast majority of athletic laborers don't achieve any long, uh, long-term viability in the world of sport, right? And mm -hmm. so, you know, this, the inequities in the sports world grow uh, as a result of this revolution. And this is why you see, you know, predominantly black athletes on big time college football programs, you know, undercompensated for their labor and then generating a lot of value for universities, right? So that's, you right. see that very clearly, and you see this very clearly, certainly this past year when yeah. sport was played during the COVID-19 pandemic. Yeah. In terms of what it did change, it provided, in the case, I talk about this in San Antonio, uh, with the rise of the San Antonio Spurs, you know, one of the things that the Spurs did really well as a fledgling ABA franchise, that it helped create a space for Mexican Americans to, to a, a claim, you know, to achieve what Gay Johnson calls spatial entitlement in mm -hmm. San Antonio, right? Uh, you know, the Spurs are one of those franchises that allowed, that understood that a significant part of their fan base were Mexican origin peoples and Mexican Americans. Right. It's not by accident today that Mexican Americans are in t San Antonio big time into the Spurs. Uh, and that might seem minuscule, but in the context of a changing society, Mexican Americans are able to achieve a level of visibility through sport, through sports spectatorship, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so, you know, and, and also I think that what, what, what happens as a result of the popularization of, of, of these successful athletes, you are seeing, you know, people think about differently about race in the same way we're seeing some of that now as a result of what's happened with the Black Lives Matter movement, right? So it's an, amb it's an ambiguous legacy no doubt there are things that did not change uh mm -hmm. and there are struggles that still, were still with us to this day but there 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 were moments where where there was some significant change and i do think that sport still has that potential for us now yeah yeah that's great i i appreciate that and i think uh you know it's important to think about the positive things and even some of the negative things that came about from it but also what what, what impact did this revolution also have on established black organizations black historically black colleges and universities yeah. and of course Many of these players went to now and they're not going to anymore as much. Yeah. Um, you're not getting the top talent going to a, pre a Prairie View A&M or even a Texas Southern or even a Grambling if you're looking at outside other states and some of the historical black programs that were really powerhouses, right? Um, what does this do to some of those black institutions that that then are, you know had benefited from this uh, original arrangement, but now maybe are, are in flux? Yeah, and in that sense, you know, um... So, you know, one of my regrets in this book is I didn't have chapters on Prairie View or T Texas Southern or any of the programs in this period. You know, I talk about them in the Jim Crow era because you have to understand, as you're suggesting, as you're highlighting here, their central role in the making of black sporting culture at all levels, you know, at, from the college level all the way down to black schools at the youth levels, right? Um, you know, certainly it seems like that, that, that the HBCUs did not benefit from the sports revolution, right? Because it is absolutely true that the schools that used to, that the, at the players used to play at TSU and Prairie View are now playing at you know university of texas austin and smu and university of houston mm -hmm. right i think that hbcu hbcu sports culture persists and it still thrives but not on the level of visibility you know aside from a grambling and these programs that are able to sort of you know ascend to the national level like grambling this is sort of the, the heyday of grambling football actually is this period right, right. when they start playing games yeah, all over the country mm -hmm. uh so you know you're seeing some evidence of of, of, of an influence on a program like that and obviously they still play a, a vital role in black communities in the state, but in terms of them having access to the top talent, no, that, 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 that changes dramatically starting in the late 1960s, right? Um, but I still think there's a lot more stories to tell about HBCUs in this period. You know, one of the great, uh, 
images that I found in my research. This is wonderful image in a documentary about the Astrodome, and it was, it was, it's, a, it's called the, the Pleasures of This Stately Dome. It's a dome. It's a 1975 documentary, and the filmmaker Jeff Winningham has this great scene of a of a Texas Southern Grambling program in the Astrodome, and the stadium is packed with black folks. And you see the marching bands performing. You see HBCU football at its best, right? And that's now that's in 1975, 76. So you still see a thriving athletic culture, but its access to top talent, you know, declines, no doubt, in this period, for sure. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I, I want to highlight again, you know, one of the areas you really focused on, of course, was the emerging professional sports uh, team. But also, of course, was the advancement in new stadiums built for these mm -hmm. Texas teams and the trends that they set for stadiums across the country. Right. Of course, the, you mentioned uh, multiple times the Astrodrome, of course, with this new green carpet called AstroTurf. Um, uh, aptly named, as well as luxury suites in, in that stadium, but also Texas Stadium, where God could watch the Cowboys play, as many <laughs> Cowboys fans used to always love to talk, say. Um, and so these set new trends for building of domed and open stadiums throughout the country. So why were these stadiums so unique and influential? And did they really change the sporting atmosphere for better or for worse? Yeah, I think you've got an ambiguous legacy and you have to conclude maybe for worse now. But I would say at the outset, so the for those of you who don't know, who don't know, the Houston Astrodome, is the first dome stadium built in this country. It's built uh, by the, the boosters who brought the Houston Astros or the Colt 45s originally Major League Baseball to, to Houston in 1960. Uh, the franchise starts playing in 1962. Uh, so it is the first stadium, as, as Darren said, with luxury boxes and every single stadium, virtually every stadium that's built as a result uh, after the Astrodome has this feature, luxury boxes that is catered to an affluent corporate crowd, no doubt. What made the Astrodome interesting and beloved by Houstonians across the social spectrum is that it catered to the corporate crowd, but it also catered to the working class fan, right? So that, you know, because black activists had secured desegregated seating, for example, in the Astrodome, black mm -hmm. Houstonians could go to games and they could afford to go to games and they could see the Astros, they could see TSU, they could see the Oilers, they could go to concerts, they could go to, even if they wanted to go to the Houston Livestock Show, they could do that too, right? So the Astrodome has a profound impact, social impact on Houston, right? So that segregated seating, you know, disappears as a result of the building of the Houston Astrodome, right? That's a positive legacy of that period. Uh, but what happens is that uh, every stadium, you know, after the Astrodome wants to imitate it in terms of its technological advancements and in terms of its catering to an uh, uh, affluent demographic. And the Cowboys Stadium that's opened in 1971, which was Texas Stadium, which is a precursor to Jerry, Jerry's World, which is their stadium now, you know, really sets the trend in terms of being number one. It's the first stadium built for an NFL franchise. NFL teams had to share their facilities before the Cowboys build Texas Stadium. Uh, it's also, if you look at Texas Stadium's sort of layout and design, it's very similar to a bunch of NFL stadiums that are built for NFL teams, right? Um, uh, that also has even more luxury boxes than the Astrodome, right? So, uh, you know, so these are the template setters for subsequent stadium construction. And we see this clearly in the financing of the stadiums in terms of, you know, most of these stadiums are, are financed by public funds. Uh, you know, I don't care what uh, stadium builders say. Uh, stadiums don't bring economic benefits to, you, to your, your cities. Uh, they generate a lot of profits for, for sports teams. And that's an unfortunate, you know, legacy of that era to the point now where most stadiums are absolutely inaccessible to the vast majority of fans. Yeah. Uh, and that's an unfortunate part of, of a legacy of that, of that, of this revolutionary change in stadium construction. Right. You know, I mean, I, I, again, we, we got, I kind of go back to the SMU you know, U of H example, but particularly I wanted to focus on University of Houston. I think, mm -hmm. you know, again, they have a unique role in this whole thing where, again, they, uh, uh, you know, they, while they that weren't the absolute first, they were the ones that really, I think, started to open the floodgates when it comes to integration um, in their athletic programs, not only just with Warren McVay and football, but certainly when Guy Lewis, um, the head basketball coach of U of H, really starts to begin to heavily recruit Black athletes in the programs in the 60s. And of course, recruited one of the most dominant, well-known teams of the 1980s, nicknamed Five Slamma Jamma. So what really made the University of Houston go out of its way to be trendsetters in this area? Yeah. So part of the answer is that they wanted to compete, right? The University of Houston was a small school. It was sort of seen, you know, by some obnoxious Texans as, you know, like a glorified high school, particularly in relationship to Rice University, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and like a lot of athletic programs, you know, uh, they figure out like, okay, we're going to use sport to promote our university, right? And they do it, and they do it very well. Uh, and they have the longtime basketball coach, Guy Lewis, who's from East Texas, kind of similar to Hayden Fry. Mm -hmm. East Texan who decides that it's more important for him to win games than to be loyal to white supremacy, 
All right. So yes, he signs Elvin Hayes and John Cheney in the in the late 1960s, and that catapults Houston basketball to you know national recognition with the famous 1968 game at the Astrodome when they beat UCLA and Lou Alcindor, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, um, on January 20th, 1968. So so the story there is like administrators and coaches recognizing that okay, you know, sport is something we need. Uh, black athletes are necessary for us to compete. And if we're going to join the Southwest Con- Conference, which they did, um, we're going to need the talents of black athletes, right? Uh, and so, you know, this process continues through the 1970s with both Houston f- football and basketball. And then in the 1980s, early 80s, when Guy Lewis starts to, you know, continue to recruit Houston era talent, you know, in the chapter on the Fly Slam and Jamma, I talk about the role of the Fondy Recreational Center as this sort of playground, well, what, you know, the sort of pickup basketball scene in Houston that has where enormous talent, black talent primarily congregates in that facility where pros are playing against local kids, where a lot of these kids are, are playing, you know, local ball and they want to, you know, being signed by the Cougars. It's this like hub of, of basketball culture and talent in Houston, which is often overlooked. Yeah. Um, and so the key to Fly Slamma Jamma's success is Lewis really tapping into local black high schools, right? And, and, and integrated schools at that point too. Mm-hmm. And that really catapults that program to being one of the great programs of its time, even though it doesn't win a national championship. But to me, that's irrelevant. You know, it has a stylistic impact. And of course, uh, Guy Lewis is lucky because Hakeem Olajuwon basically winds up in Houston and he becomes one of the greatest centers in, in the history of, of, of collegiate and professional basketball. Yeah. So, you know, the story there is this kind of you seeing the emergence of a school, you know, tapping into this, this black grassroots sport culture in Houston, mm-hmm. you know, leading to the program becoming really successful in the 1970s and 80s. Right. Absolutely. No, I think you've seen that similar since instances with John Thompson and, and absolutely. John Hoyer's There's so many right parallels. In the absolutely. Area, right. That's right. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely a, 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 a formula in terms of, again, recruiting the hometown and the local black team, black talent um, to really increase and improve your program. So um, I, I want to move things a little bit forward as we're getting close to our, our Q&A session and, and certainly how we move towards into today's atmosphere. Right. So, yeah. I mean, how does your book shed light on today's athlete activist movement? You talked about already Black Lives Matter movement and a lot of the athlete um, movements we're seeing um, on social, but also in, um, in, 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 in the sports world, in, in our professional and intercollegiate world, right? So what, 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 what does your book shed light on, on when it comes to current athlete activist movements? Thanks, Darren. Yes, um, it allows us, number one, to think about another moment of athletic insurgency that, that, that occurred in this period, the late 60s, early 70s, right? A period that we associate with Black act, athletic activists, right? The famous folks, the Muhammad Ali's, the Harry Edwards, the Tommy Smiths and John Carlos's and people like that. But, you know, if you widen the frame behind, you know, beyond the big names, uh, you know, you're seeing a whole lot of athletic activism happening all over the country and in Texas as well. Right. Sure. And it's not just by black athletes. You know, you're seeing impelled by the black power movement, impelled by the anti-war movement, you know, a massive movement of refusal among athletes at the professional and collegiate levels. Right. So, you know, in the case of Texas, you know, you're seeing, you know, you're seeing athletes refuse the authority of coaches at TCU in 1970, 71. You've got a crew of black athletes who are resisting. Uh, their coaches' authoritarian policies. Mm-hmm. You're seeing, you know, white athletes, you know, raising questions about masculinity in football. There's a great book from this period published uh, by a former Longhorn named Gary Shaw called Meat on the Hoof, yep. in which, you know, he exposes Darrell Royal's program for its all of its ruthless exploitation. Uh, but he's also raising questions about the illogic of masculinity that guides football culture. Gary Shaw's book is often overlooked. Mm-hmm. So you've got this earlier moment of, of a cross-racial, national, but also regional athletic activist movement that in many ways, today's movement is picking up on a lot of those threads, right? So yes. it's picking up on the solidarity protest with Black people outside of the sports world and the dispossessed outside of the sports world, right? But now it's also raising questions about inequities in the sports world. And that's what's been interesting over the last few weeks. And we just saw this this week, you know, with March Madness going on with women athletes, you know, highlighting their absolutely appalling conditions their training conditions in San Antonio, as opposed to the, the luxury, you know, um, accommodations and facilities that the male athletes had in, in having in Indianapolis this week when they're playing the tournament. Right. So, you know, uh, today's movement is obviously guided by and impelled by the conditions of our time, the pandemic, uh, you know, police violence. But, you know, Me Too movement, you know, as well. Uh, and we're seeing, you know, now athletes, you know, raising a kind of question and pushing back against the authorities, uh, you know, to really forge a more just and equitable sports world and it's just, you know, equitable, sport, uh, equitable society in general. And I think that's exciting. So you're seeing, you know, similar trends from what you saw 50 years ago, 
But because now you have women athletes, you know, in much more abundance now than they did than they were back then, you know, you're seeing them raise a bunch of questions about pay equity, around sexuality, a bunch, a bunch of things that are making this, this moment really interesting and exciting from the perspective of social change. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, um, Howard Bryant calls it the uh, the heritage when it comes to black That's athletes it. in there. Um, the the the, the, the length they're held in, but certainly in terms of their influence and their ability to use their platform um, for the greater good, right? That we've seen that from early um, from early black stars and integrationists, of course, the Jackie Robinsons and the, and the, the Hank Aaron's and everyone who you know, really kind of paved the way. Um, but certainly. Uh, even throughout the 60s and 70s in the era that you really focus on. But then um, now we've kind of really seen a resurgence of it, even after kind of a, a kind of a period of uh, neutrality or greenwashing per se, when the sports and money really grows for the athlete in that exactly um, right. there's so much impetus placed upon athletes really, again, focusing on their brand and not necessarily speaking out to uh, risk their brand, right? And the ability to capitalize off of their name, image, likeness and so forth, right? But now of course, with, with, with course, like you said, police uh, brutality with the pandemic and, and Me Too, athletes are seeing the need to really continue to use their platform and speak out and they've reconnected with that heritage, which is awesome. That's exactly um, right. I mean, that's a great book, Howard. Uh, Howard was right on about that. And, and it's nice to see, you know, after raising that heritage. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, okay, with that being said, let me go ahead and transition uh, to Q&A. We do have some questions from some of our audience members, and, and certainly, uh, um, hopefully, you're up for the task. And so let me bring forth our first question. And uh, certainly, given the timing of it, it's very much a very appropriate right now. Um, so uh, Eric is, uh, is talking about um, his question relates to the current wave of Black student activists. So in particular, uh, he was wondering, what are Dr. Garitti's thoughts on the eyes of Texas that it relates to the power dynamics of a majority wealthy white fan base and predominantly black underprivileged athletes? I was not expecting this question at all. I'm saying that sarcastically. <laughs> um, yeah, I have a lot of thoughts about this. I'll try to condense them. You know, uh, one of the things that we saw, I'll just speak I'll just speak to the Austin case, the UT Austin case. What, you know, when, when the football players uh, started protesting last summer, the solidarity protests, I was astonished. That was something that I did not see coming. At Texas A&M, we see a similar dynamic there, right. um, well, raising all kinds of questions about the, you know, the white supremacist legacy of the institution. Uh, that was extraordinary. I, I didn't see that coming. Uh, and, and so there were, of course, the list of demands, uh, you know, and, and the more cosmetic demands were met. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the renaming of the field after Ricky Williams and Earl Campbell, the erection of the statue to Julius Whittier, the first black Longhorn football player, scholarship football player. Right. Um, you know, those are significant, but they're fairly cosmetic, I would argue. Right. Uh, and once the Big 12, uh, you know, forced coerced players to play, you know, in this pandemic, like other conferences did, mm -hmm. uh, then you really saw how valuable, you know, the university administration uh, sees its, 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 its players, its, its athletic laborers who are supposedly students, right? I'm just being totally frank about this. Absolutely. Um, you see that they don't really care that much about their health and safety, right? Uh, and so the poor players had to go out there and play, right? And so the eyes of Texas issue is not just the song. It is about the ways in which the program and football culture still has the ghosts and legacies of white supremacy. Mm -hmm. That, you know, in which in this case, you're seeing, you know, predominantly black players perform undercompensated for predominantly white donor base and students and other you know, Longhorn fans who are not white, but that the inequities in that structure are so clear, right? Uh, that, you know, the eyes of Texas issue is, is the song and its legacy, but it's about the ways in which game day just rehearses and re, reinscribes that legacy every single Saturday. And I know that when I used to go to games and I saw the stark contrast between what you saw at Memorial Stadium on Saturday afternoons and what you saw at the rest of campus, which is a much more inclusive, you know, uh, you know, society that was a little more representative of what you wanted Texas to look like. It wasn't perfect. But it, the, the inequities weren't so stark as they are when you go to a Longhorn football game. And I apologize for offending Longhorn fans, but that was my impression of the place. And I think the athletes know that, right? Um, and I think that the, the, the alma mater issue is just, it's just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, it, it, there are a host of issues there that, that are with us that originate from the Jim Crow era, originate before that in terms of slavery, but are getting replicated in our, in our contemporary circumstance. And those are the issues that have to be addressed and they haven't been yet. Yeah, absolutely. 
Uh, let me uh, get another question from Asar, switching to another Texas school. Uh, he wanted to speak more on the interest conversion as it relates to UTEP, then Texas Western winning the ma basketball national championship in 1966 with their all black starting five, including David Latin. Yes, and that's the program that, that beat Adolph Ruff's segregationist Kentucky Wildcats in the 1966 NCAA championship game. Right. And I've gotten this question before, and I cringe every single time because I only mentioned UTEP in passing. I only mentioned the Texas Western story in passing uh, because, you know, this is a situation where I wanted to address a number of issues in this book, right? So I wanted this book to not just be about football or basketball. I wanted to approach multiple sports. So this is a book that has football, professional, collegiate, talks about Major League Baseball coming to Dallas-Fort Worth and also Houston, talks about tennis, right? Uh, and so the UTEP story is profoundly significant and re reinforces the point I'm making, which is that Texas's impact on, uh, on American sporting culture in terms of integration. But I, I kind of left it out because I, I was interested in other questions, right? And, and pursuing stories that people really hadn't focused on as much, right? Um, uh, which is not to say that UTEP, Texas Western's uh, program was insignificant. It, in some ways, they're, they're starting the integration process before SMU, for sure. This is what Charles Martin shows, right? Um, and they have a profound impact on the borderland region. And they have a profound impact in terms of college basketball producing places, people like Nolan Richardson, the very famous black coach who, who wins national championships with Arkansas in the 1990s, right? So, but it just didn't fit in my analysis, to be honest with you. Um, it's also interesting because even when I was looking at the press at the time, you know, it, it's, it's, it gets coverage, but even in the black press, it doesn't get that much coverage, which mm. I was a little puzzled by, right? And I think it's because the black press was so focused on black schools even then, right? If you, if you look at the Houston Forward Times uh, and look at the Dallas Express, you know, they're focusing on the local schools. They're focusing on TSU. They're focusing on the black schools. And then they cover the white schools. And the coverage of Texas Western was, was, was not as significant as you would expect, you know? And I think it's an event that grows in significance in retrospect, sure. right? Uh, but at the time, you know, it, it was significant, but it wasn't as impactful as you would expect. And that was my impression of the historical evidence. And that was another reason why I decided to sort of, sort of mention it, of course. But I think the story I'm telling here just reinforces the, the things that we already know about Texas Western's impact. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, I have another question kind of looking at mm -hmm. thinking forward about Texas and maybe its role in terms of uh, uh, the sporting uh, uh, culture. Um, from Asar again, how do you think Texas, or do you think Texas will or should have a pivotal role in elevating soccer in America to the level of inter interest internationally, right? Of course, we have the Houston Dynamo. We now have Austin FC, who was la uh, had, uh, launching their inaugural season this year. Um, so could Texas be on the forefront of that revolution when it comes to finally maybe getting um, America right there in, with the best of them in, in, the, in the world's game? Yeah, and I think that's, I think that's going to happen. I think soccer's uh, you know, it's got to be elevated in the society, whether people accept it or not. I think it's just, a, it's, it's almost inevitable. Um, you know, I'm not an expert on contemporary soccer, um, uh, you know, the so soccer industry. Uh, you know, when I first conceived of doing this book, when I lived in Austin, you know, I had a whole vision of like, a, I really wanted to look at kind of lat Latinx uh, immigrant, um, you know, grassroots soccer culture, which, mm -hmm. you know, there's a strong history of that in Texas as in other places. But then I left, I made the mistake of leaving Austin. <laughs> uh, uh, and then I had my research focus had to change because I mean, I know this in part because uh, there are family members who, of mine who live in San Antonio are very plugged into the soccer scene, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so there's a robust soccer scene, uh, you know, that mirrors what you see in the rest of society. It's a fairly suburban sport for sure, but they're, you know, among, you know, immigrant communities, it's very much a grassroots sport. Mm -hmm. And I suspect because of the predominance of undocumented peoples, because of the centrality of immigrant communities to the, to the foundation of Texas today, you know, it's going to have an impact at, the, at that level and certainly in, at the level of the professional level, at, at the industry level, right? Um, and I think that process is under, underway. And I think that the, even though there's been many moments in the past where we predicted soccer to sort of take over, um, I think that that's, that's going to happen. And I think Texas, it makes sense for it to happen there because it has the climate, it has the conditions that you would want. It has the capital, it has the enthusiasm, enthusiasm the, the, the crew of sports enthusiasts right. uh, to make a sporting revolution in Texas happen. Uh, you know, that's my impressionistic, um, you know, claim here. Uh, I, I suspect it will. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so as we begin to close, I want to want to allow you to have some part, some parting shots, and uh, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll pose a question, and then I'll just allow you to really kind of answer that and, and and give us any of your last remarks that you want mm -hmm. to really leave us with um, as we close out our book talk. So thinking about just the future 
um, in sports and the, and the current status of sports right now, especially in the state of Texas, right? I mean, um, the Southwest Conference is no more. Yeah. Um, the Dallas Cowboys moved out of Texas Stadium and they're in Jerry World and they're still losing, right? <laughs> Haven't been to the Super Bowl in over 25 years. The Houston Texans aren't getting anywhere closer. Uh, the Astros won an, a World Series. However, that's under the the, they were the cheaters. <laughs> the shade of cheating, right? Right. In terms of that scandal. Uh, and, and so we're kind of just in the middling, you know, effect that where our Texas teams, um, they've done okay, but you know, we haven't really seen our, our football teams, our college football teams, especially, of course, we're talking about Texas Longhorn, Texas A&M. They haven't had the success that, you know, people have expected of a, a state that has this rich resources and all the talent that we can provide to everyone else, but can't keep here. Right. So where mm-hmm. does Texas fit in this future um, in this future influence of, of sport and, and the way we go, sport management and, and how the sport continues to evolve and how we continue to really live sport as a society um, in the United States and the world and, and how does Texas play a role in all that? Yeah, great, great, Darren. Um, you know, this moment to hear you talk, it reminds me of the 1980s moment. You know, I end the book in the 1980s where, you know, I'm arguing that the kind of sports revolution peters out in terms of its social effect. Sure. You know, integration is not novel by the 1980s, right? Uh, you know, you're seeing, you know, big money continue to flow into sports. But, you know, in terms of wins and losses, it's kind of a, aside from women's programs, you know, this is actually the heyday of Texas women's basketball, act, the University of Texas Longhorn women's mm-hmm. basketball. You see women's athletic programs going on the way up in the 80s, which is an interesting uh, element of the story. Um, but in terms of men's teams, uh, you know, uh, the, the, you know the, the, the teams aren't doing very well. There's also the period where the oil, you know, the oil economy collapses in the 1980s and it brings enormous devastation to Texas all over the state, right? And it has a major impact on, on the financing of, of sports at that time. Right. So in some ways, you're seeing a similar dynamic in terms of wins and losses on the field, right? So, you know, I think what's happening in contemporary sport now, not just in Texas, but I'll just use these cases as an example. I think the Cowboys are an interesting example, is that team owners have figured out how to make enormous money without your team being successful, right? Uh, yes. Jerry Jones <laughs> has figured out how to commodify every aspect of the Cowboy brand, every inch of his stadium, right? And his team doesn't have to do that well, actually, right. to make a lot of money, right? And you see this across the sporting landscape so that even though we're told that, yes, winning is everything, you look at the way that a lot of owners operate now, uh, it seems like they're much more interested in making a lot of money for their bloated management class and actually producing a, a product on the field that's, that's even entertaining and compelling, right? So that's an interesting development, right? What, what's going to help in this case, says the social movement historian, is that sport is going to continue to have a social impact. And it's going to continue to have a social impact because the predominant labor force in the big time sports world are marginalized peoples, right? And this goes back to the athletic activism discussion. I think the days of stick to sports are, you know, they, they may not disappear forever, you know, just shut up and dribble, but, but you already see in 2021 that athletes are really not going to just shut up and dribble, at least not for now. Right. right. Uh, and maybe this is overly optimistic, but, I, you know, as I always say, so long as the industry relies on the, the labors of black and marginalized peoples, so long as the, will the opportunity present itself for justice to be raised, you know, whether that's in the sports world or without. And as our country and as Texas in particular, you know, continues to struggle uh, with, you know, authoritarianism and white supremacy and, and, and uh, you know, the corporate billionaire domination of our society, uh, you know, sport's going to remain relevant, right? And because it has such a huge cultural impact because of the transformations of the period that I talk about, mm-hmm. it's going to remain relevant. And I think for somebody who doesn't think about sport or think it's significant, you know, I would invite you to not worry about whether you're a fan of a team or not, but to think about why does sport have such an outsized impact on our society, right? Uh, you know, what kinds of questions is the sport role raising that's relevant beyond the sports world? And I think we're, we're seeing that, you know, since last year. And to me, that's an encouraging sign, you know, as somebody who thinks again that sport you know can catalyze change uh, it has and, and you know it may result in more wins and championships for texas teams you know uh or or more importantly it may result in a new conception of what we think sport should be as it relates to society that's my hope absolutely absolutely dr gritty thank you so much uh for joining us today and, and being with us this was an excellent discussion and conversation about Um, your new book, The Sports Revolution, on how Texas changed the culture of American athletics. I've enjoyed reading the uh, copy. And to those of you who are out there, again, the book is out today. All right. You can get it on Amazon. You can go through UT Press directly. Get it at Barnes & Noble. 
if you can get it from a local bookstore, yeah, primarily please. one that's owned by, you know, black or people of color, right? If you can get it yeah. through there, great. And get a physical copy because they need to read it and maybe pass it on to someone else. All right. But again, the book is out. Check it out. Uh, and, and thank you, Dr. Gritty, for joining us today. And, and, and thank you all for being here with us today for our discussion about his book. Dr. Darren Kelly, I just have to thank you. I have to thank you for your time. Uh, I'm sure you don't have time to read other people's books. Uh, uh, that's not part of your everyday work. So I really appreciate your time and your energy and your generosity. Thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day. Okay. Take care.